So hi, everybody. My name is Lauren. I'm a game developer. And I really don't know if I want kids. It's OK. You could laugh. What I just said is uncomfortable. Why would I open with that? It's really weird. Here's the thing. As I'm approaching my 30s as a woman, no matter the context, no matter my success, this question has been creeping in at the edges of my conversations, both professional and personal. And it's happening more and more. And it's not really coming from me. It shows up as things like, go to Europe now before you have kids or a husband. Or how does your boyfriend feel about all this travel that you're doing? And then it was, when are you going to start dating again? You know you're getting that age, and it's going to get harder. It was even Google changing the ads that they showed me from condom ads telling me that I need to wrap it up or I'll end up with screaming children to suddenly pregnancy test ads where everyone looks pretty jazzed about the whole thing. And I can feel people asking me this question all the time, but I also feel like I'm definitely not supposed to answer it. I'm definitely not supposed to answer it on stage in front of this many of my peers. Because as a female developer, even mentioning the idea that I might possibly want children can honestly feel like I'm throwing my career to the curb. It's not something that you talk openly about. It's maybe something that you whispered about at the pub with your female coworkers. It's something that you might ask your CTO when you find out that she's got kids. Did you go through pregnancy in the industry? Did you go through crunch? Were you worried? If I make that choice, should I be? A large part of this is obviously coming from the fact that our industry isn't especially gentle with mothers, or unfortunately with women in general, as we've seen over the past few years. Now, I think there's some really great talks and articles out there by people who have thought a lot more than I have on that particular subject. So I'm not going to go into that too much today. But there's another part of this that I do really want to talk about. And I think that's the stories that we as an industry are choosing to tell about mothers. We definitely have moms in games, but the stories that we tell about them don't tend to be all that aspirational. We've got the mom that our intrepid adventurer sets out from at the beginning of their quest. She's got an apron, she cooks, she calls you dear. She might, if you're lucky, be a plot device late in the game because she stumbled into a time portal. I know that Cooking Mama technically doesn't fit into this category, but I thought it was funny how much she actually looks like Chrono Tigger's mom, like they even have the same orange on their apron. Then we've got this oddly specific, I had a daughter only for the purpose of stealing her body and extending my own life, like in Ico and Dragon Age. And ever a classic, we have Dead Mom, who helps round out our hero's character or set really important plot uh, devices in motion. And I don't know about you, but while I love all those games, I just named a ton of my personal favorites. I don't think I really want to be any of those moms. Maybe Body Snatcher Mom is kind of cool and like a, when I was in my goth phase way, but probably not. And the rest of the tropes that we've got for moms, I don't really want to be any of those either. I think my options are like Prostitute Mom, Absent Mom, Dead Mom, thanks, but no thanks. But I'm actually getting ahead of myself because I don't get to play as them that often anyway. We really, really rarely get to actually play as a mother. We've got some awesome notable examples. In Shelter, you get to be a cool badger mom. 
But these are an exception, and they're few and far between. Which is funny, because we've had a lot of really fucking cool dads in games recently. We are totally in the time of the dad. We had The Last of Us, which got what a heart-wrenching paternal narrative. Silent Hill got in on the action. Even Kratos, the god of war, is a dad. And that, that is fucking awesome. I am so excited that we are telling some stories about men right now that might involve things like nurturing or having feelings instead of just maiming and killing. Or at least we're doing it along with some maiming and killing because Kratos is the god of war, so he probably still needs to do that. Uh, but we're, just, we're still just not doing a great job with moms. So what's that about? Why can we tell complicated stories about fathers, but we can't do it with mothers? Part of this is culture. We've been telling these stories for ages. I mean, look at Disney. We've had a lot of wicked stepmothers. And Disney did not make these stories up. These are old stories. I'm sure y'all in the Netherlands probably know that better than I do. Or, hey, in a Disney film, if your mother was a good mother, she damn well better have a tragic death before the home's halfway point. We do still get a lot of single dads, though, after those mothers die their tragic deaths, being eaten by barracudas or killed by humans, and those father characters do get to be pretty varied and interesting. And this isn't looking that different from what I laid out earlier with games. We're not treading on new territory here. So part of it is that these stories are old. There's this other part to it, though. I think our industry is aging, but we're still pretty male-dominated. So a lot of the people who are making games right now are men in their 30s and 40s who are having kids, and they want to tell stories about fatherhood. A paternal narrative is going to be the one that really speaks to them. It's what's relevant to their lives. But unfortunately, that means we're leaving someone else's story behind. What happened to mom? And I don't think that this omission is intentional. I do, however, think our solution will have to be. Let's pause for a second, though. Uh, who am I? Why well, am I up here rambling about whether or not I want kids and the finer points of Disney? I am Lauren Kaysen. I've been working in games for about seven years. I got my start as an intern at the MIT Game Lab, and from there, I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of amazing studios. A game I worked on with a previous studio ship about a month ago. The game is called Luna from Phenomena. It's out for PC VR. Check it out on Steam. I've got another game that I worked on coming out very early next year called Where the Water Tastes Like Wine from Dimbulb Games. You can wish list it on Steam now. Hashtag like, comment, subscribe. Uh, and I am currently a senior artist at Us2 Games, where we recently shipped Monument Valley 2, which is what I'll be talking about today. So Monument Valley 2, for those of you who don't know, is a game about a mother, Ro, and the way her relationship with her daughter changes over time, told through puzzles and impossible architecture. The basic mechanic idea is that you move around in impossible space to solve puzzles and progress through the world. And here's the trailer for anybody who knows nothing about the game.
So we announced and launched simultaneously at WWDC this year after developing it in secret for a year and a half. And actually, a little aside, we were super excited that Apple chose a pregnant woman to announce our game. We didn't actually know they were going to do that, but it was super thematically fitting. And we've been really lucky that we've seen a lot of success so far. We reached number one in the App Store in over 80 countries. We comfortably surpassed the first game in most metrics, and we recently got awarded Unity Mobile Game of the Year. And the thing in the game that I think most of us on the team were the most proud of was the story that we chose to tell. It was a story of this woman who became a mother and how her life changed, which is a common, beautiful human story that, for some reason, we're not really telling that much. When we started prototyping for Monument Valley 2, though, we didn't actually know that this was the game we were going to make. In the early stages of development, we had ambitions of telling multiple stories within the game and sort of weaving them together as a fairy tale narrative. And while this broad ambition really helped us develop some cool mechanics, the scope was ultimately really unrealistic. And we decided we probably wanted to tell one story and we wanted to tell it really well. We had all these characters that we'd done concept art for and mechanics that we'd prototyped. But in playtesting, there was this one character, one, this one set of characters, that people were having a really visceral emotional reaction to. And that was this mother and child. This was also the story arc that a lot of us on the development team were the most excited about. I remember really distinctly a meeting we had early on in development where we were talking about whether it was the characters or it was the mechanic that people were resonating with. So would it matter if we replaced this child following the mother with a crow from the original game following a new character? And what happened was a lot of us on the dev team absolutely rallied behind this mother, that we thought that this was a story that wasn't being told, that was real. And Florian, one of our designers, closed the meeting saying, I would be honored to tell her story. And that was it. This was our character. This was our game. We knew that this was what we wanted to make. How are we going to tell that story, though? Monument Valley has no faces. It's got no real dialogue. Our characters are this big. A big part of our storytelling toolbox is going to be the mechanics of the puzzles themselves. We had a huge number of puzzle, pre -mechanic, uh, puzzle mechanic prototypes to work from. And probably only about 10% of the puzzles that we came up with actually made it into the final game. So there were three main types of puzzles that we ended up choosing to begin with. We had follow puzzles, where one character is following another directly. We had solo puzzles, which are a lot like Monument Valley 1. And we had puzzles where you could tap the screen and move the characters independently. Most of these puzzles, the independent puzzles, were actually interesting. The rehashing of a previous prototype, where we designed this group of puzzles to tell the story of a pair of star-crossed lovers. And these three types of puzzles were used to represent three stages that each of the characters goes through of dependence and a journey of self-knowledge and eventually coming back together in a new kind of relationship after lessons learned alone. And to be clear, all of this was super fluid. Here is our art director, David, moving things around on our printout wall. We had printouts of every single puzzle in the game, and we'd spend a lot of time moving stuff around on that wall. Would the flow make more sense here if this particular level was a child level? Would putting a storyteller moment in here add something? And honestly, being able to look out across a wall and see the entire game at once really, really helped us when we were trying to solidify our overall story arc and what we were trying to say. And we definitely changed a lot. Here, we moved a level out of the mother story. There was almost an entire swap of the mother and child chunks. We replaced our ending. Watch for it. We're going to do that about five more times. Um, there it goes. New ending. We got rid of two levels at the beginning. 
Replace the entire ending again. There it goes. Yeah, these animations are a little long. There we go. All right. So that's one way to work. I'm not saying it's the best way to work, but I am saying it's a really good idea to try and keep yourself fluid through development, because a lot of those changes we actually put in two weeks before launch. Um, so let's dig into some of these puzzle mechanics and phases that I talked about earlier and start with the opening of the game. So savvy players might actually recognize the puzzle. We wanted to make a callback here to the original Monument Valley. The opening was really important to us, and it was something we spent a long time figuring out at the studio. Specifically, how are we going to introduce these characters? We thought about having a pregnant bro, or having her carrying a little baby. Both of these didn't work for practical readability reasons. It's really hard to tell a character is pregnant and doesn't just have like a weird blob when they're that big on screen. But there was another reason that we didn't go in that direction. We really wanted to establish Ro as her own person before introducing the child, that she was an independent entity. So we decided that our opening screen would be this woman, alone in the world, creating music for herself. Another way that we chose to reinforce Ro as our protagonist, and this was really hotly debated within the team, was we named Ro, but we didn't name her child. When we were researching maternal narratives, one thing that we saw and we really didn't want to repeat was that when people tell the story of a mother and a child, a lot of times it's really just the story of the child and then the mom as a character in it. And that was something that we didn't want to do and we really were interested in telling her a story and reinforcing that this was about her. So we start off with that solo puzzle, where it's alone, but that's only really very brief. And then we're immediately introduced to the child on the next level. Child runs in off screen, gives her a big hug. I'll talk more about the hug moments later. And this follow mechanic seems pretty simple, right? It's not especially revolutionary to have a follow mission in your game. Uh, but implementation of this actually ended up being really tricky. If the child is following the mother, the AI is trying to pathfind to the mother, what does that actually mean when you're working with impossible geometry? This required a lot of tuning, and the solution ended up being this combination of screen space and world space and a tool and engine that we ended up calling Candy. And honestly, that could be an entire 40-minute tech talk, so I won't go into it too much, but it's, it's pretty cool. So we've got that simple follow mechanic that we can use to set up some pretty juicy narrative moments, but let's break it down a bit more first. What are the most base things that a player needs to understand about how this works before we can start playing with it. The main things are the child follows the mother. It will try to be as close to her as possible. You control the mother directly, and you can only control the child through Rose movements. And we introduce the player to each of those concepts really gradually before we start breaking the rules or changing them. And by starting with this simple, solid, easy to understand foundation, we're able to make small tweaks in how this mechanic works that has a really big narrative impact. So for example, we've established that the child follows the mother, that she's always skipping along at her mother's heels. We can create tension by maintaining that construct the child follows, but putting them on separate paths. The first time we introduce that is here. The path breaks and the mother falls away and the child AI keeps running to try and stay close to the mother. Most of the tension here isn't created with custom animation, so there is one where the child falls down. But it's just by tweaking this dynamic of this mechanic that we have already set up. We played with this idea of separate paths early on in the game quite a lot to create tension. My two personal favorite implementations were in this level, where I think the follow mechanic and the impossibility really shine, and this one. So if you see the animation, the simplicity of it just trying to get to row creates so much tension, and I think it really helps build the relationship and the urgency and the dependency between the characters without a bunch of authored interactions outside of this context that we've built already. So after separating them, 
and bringing them back together, we can make another small tweak. Ro guides her child to stand in front of her and start leading the way. We wanted to show moments of play, of teaching, of watching over a little one, but we also didn't want the same feeling of dependency or urgency that you got when the child was following. It felt really weird when mom is like running after the child right on her heels. So in the first chunk, we kept that traditional character A follows character B, but then we actually decided to place Ro in scenes, but on her own platform for a few levels. Having her on a one square platform reduces player confusion about what character they're actually supposed to be moving. People don't have to try to move Ro, and it also just felt really nice narratively. She watches over as the child plays and learns, but she's not literally following her child because the path doesn't allow for it. Her head does still follow the child around the scene, though. And she actually takes a break at one point to sort of play her flute and chill out a bit. After this, we reach the docks, where I think we had our most poetic merging of AI and narrative. So let's watch. Uh, Rose sends her child off as she jumps in the boat and starts sailing away. She runs to the back of the boat to see Mother One last time. This was actually a mistake. We prototyped this scene, and the boat was two units wide, hit play, and the child AI ran to the back of the boat to try to get back to mom. But it broke all of our little hearts on the dev team, so we decided to keep it. And this was another key moment for us, where it was really important that we put the focus on Ro. It seemed originally like it would make sense in the scene to follow the boat, and as the child goes away and starts their journey, that that was the dynamic and exciting thing happening in the scene. But we knew we wanted to keep the camera on Ro here because she's also coming to the end of a phase in her life. So the kids left the nest, Ro's life moves on. Sort of, this part of the game ends up looking pretty grim. Uh, this level was actually really the baby of our art director, David. Uh, when we were thinking about what we wanted Ro's story to feel like immediately after the child leaves, he was really adamant about grief. And he was drawing here largely from his own feelings about coming back to work after paternity leave for the birth of his child. He has told me that he felt something along the lines of, I just wanted to be with my baby, and it made me hate work and also everyone. And the, <laughs> this feeling was what he wanted to portray, was going back to work, and work that you love, but also that pain of leaving your child for the first time. We referenced a lot of brutalist architecture and minimalist beauty and functionality for this part of the game. And Ro, she's starting a journey of growth here in this level. Both characters are. But their separate journeys here are speaking to different things. The child's growth is a lot more literal. She's literally growing up. But the thing is, Ro is already a fully formed person. She's got a craft and her art, and we wanted her growth to be more introspective and more internal. So how do we do this? Well, first she comes out of her grief. The world gets a little more color and texture as she moves through her sadness. And she meets an old friend who reminds her about her own childhood and her own mother, which culminates in this level, Menenthal. It's a level that loops infinitely in on itself and that we use to explore Rose's internal narrative about herself and her own childhood and her own mother. She remembers her mother sending her off in a boat. She remembers learning to play the flute. And again, here we're playing with the idea of following. Ro is actually running after her, the little child version of herself you see running along the screen. And interestingly, this was actually one of the very first puzzles that we prototyped. And it was the last one to make it into the game. We had it kicking around on the printout wall for ages. And we could never really quite find a home for it narratively. But when we decided we wanted Ro to have this sort of inward introspective journey, we saw that it was perfect for telling that story. The child's journey here is again more about literal growth. She's literally growing up. And we use the metaphor of foliage a lot when creating child levels. You see it show up when she's introduced, when she's learning to lead for the first time, and here when she's growing on her own. And after they both had their respective journeys, 
the pair comes back together. And here we start using the independent control scheme, and the game culminates with them creating something together, neither one following the other, but both having equal footing and control over their world. So that's the sort of puzzle journey that you take through the game. So what are some of the other tools that we use to tell the story of Rowan and her child? Uh, so for example, we had the storyteller moments. These were little narrative interludes between levels. They actually came about originally because we had these cool little impossibility chunks that were really only just sort of a three second aha moment, couldn't be expanded to a full level. But they're also really good moments for explaining the character's emotional landscape. We tried to shy away from things that felt like specific dialogue and go for something that had more of a feeling of poetry than dictation and left a lot of room for interpretation on the part of the player. And another big tool was animation, but specifically a very limited palette of animation. I talked a lot earlier about how the AI following was really important narratively. Outside of that, we had two animations that we repeated over and over and over within the game. The hug animation and the kneeling animation that was done at Plinths. And by taking these familiar elements, this hug, and putting them in slightly different contexts, we're able to tell a really different range of emotions. So you take the same hug and you put it in these different contexts, and it means something totally different. It's tension relief, or it's goodbye, or it's hello, or it's a comfort. And man, just aside, internally in the team, we stressed so much about the hugs. Like, did we have too many hugs? Did we have too few hugs? Did we need more hugs? Like the number of hug meetings that we had and those conversations were hilarious. And when I talk about context, a lot of that is gonna come from things like color and value. I talked about the wall that we print the game off onto and the color scripting in Monument Valley is one of the most curated parts of the game. When the child is learning, everything is playful and bright and pastel. At docks, we have this dusky sort of blade runnery color scheme where you're not sure if it's daybreak or if it's just becoming night, if it's the end or the beginning of a journey. In the orchard, we go from incredibly dark to incredibly bright as the child grows. And in the mother's journey, we see her finding the color in her world again. I'm biased because my job title is artist and it might seem really basic, but color can be such an important part of storytelling that often gets overlooked. And one more thing I wanna to speak to regarding the mother's story. While some members of the team are parents, we have several fathers. None of us on the dev team are actually mothers. How do you make a game that isn't about your lived experience? especially when the precedent that has been set isn't necessarily great, and do that respectfully. One thing that we tried to do was include mothers in our conversation about our games. We did a lot of play testing and focus groups with moms, specifically with older women who had children who had left home. Um, our lead designer, John, would actually take a, a bag of iPads on a train to Cornwall to do this but check in with the people whose story you're telling, especially if it's not your story. And tell a specific story. This was something that we kept having to remind ourselves of when we were making this. We'd always need to pull back in meetings and say, wait a minute, we are not trying to tell every mother's story ever here, even if motherhood is a theme. We are telling one woman's story, Roe. And the heart of things is gonna be in the details, not in grand platitudes about motherhood. And this is who we came up with. This is Ro. She was playable. She was the main character. She was complex. She has art. She has a career. She has a child. She has friends and fears. She has grief and 
growth and joy and moments of solitude and tenderness and nostalgia. As for the stuff that I opened with, I still don't fucking know what I want. I'm writing a 40 minute talk about mothers, unfortunately did not sort that out for me. Um, but regardless of what choice I make, I've been thinking a lot about moms and mothers' stories, and we just spent the last year and a half at us two really thinking hard about moms, and we tried really, really hard to do better by you. And I would urge all of you in this room, you culture makers and storytellers, to consider the stories that you're telling about mothers. Think about the stories that you're telling yourself about them, about who they are, who they are as players, the stories that you tell when they're your characters, and maybe think about whether or not that's a story that you would want somebody to tell about you. This is a narrative that's so much more complicated and nuanced and human and beautiful than women in aprons, or evil stepmothers, or dead moms. It's one of the oldest stories that we have as humans. And after seeing some of the awesome strides that we're making with dads, I am so, so excited for the strides that I know we're gonna make with maternal narratives. And hi, mom, I know you're gonna watch all of this on the internet later. Thank you.